Okay, so um, the history of astronomy is you know long. It goes back thousands of years to the ancient world, and uh, cultures from the Babylonians to the Assyrians, Egyptians, and Chinese all knew the length of the year. And that might seem you know like basic knowledge to us now, but actually uh, many of you might be hard pressed to come up with a method to track the length of one year precisely. And so it was an astronomical endeavor uh, for ancient cultures to do this. Uh, also, some cultures did not use a sun-based uh, system for their calendar. For example, the Mayans used a calendar based on the planet Venus. And there were other examples of uh, cultures building monuments uh, to the rhythms in the sky. So Stonehenge tracks the sun and moon motions, and there are many um, Mayan ruins that track the positions of uh, Venus. So this vast and rich history of astronomy is carried over into the stories that we tell about the patterns of stars that we see in the sky. So those patterns of stars are what we generally call constellations, and every culture developed its own stories about those shapes. So most of the shapes that we know of in modern astronomy are borrowed from the ancient Greeks, and that's because when the International Astron Astronomical Union in 1928 defined the modern uh, constellations, they borrowed most of those from the Greek. And those modern constellations are a little bit different than just those images uh, you know, of stars connected by sticks, uh, connected to a story from folklore. Instead, the modern constellations are more like states on a map. So they're regions of sky that generally do contain the constellation as we think of them from the ancient Greek. Um, but some of these constellations, the modern constellations, are not ancient in origin. They had to be you know, basically defined to fit in between the constellations that we had before. All right, so these are states on a map, and that's, I think, the best way to think about them. And in addition to the, what we think of as the constellations within them, there's also lots of other interesting stuff in the sky in those constellation patches. So those sectors. Um, contain what we might call today, instead of constellations, asterisms. So the asterisms would be the patterns, the sticks connecting the stars, right? Those can be defined as an asterism. So for example, the asterism Gemini resides in the constellation sector Gemini as well. Uh, but there are other asterisms that are not restricted to a single constellation sector, but instead span across constellation sectors. And those asterisms we generally use to navigate the night sky. So uh, the most famous example that's useful at this time of year is called the Winter Circle or the Winter Hexagon. And that consists of stars Aldebaran, Capella, Pollux and Castor, Procyon, Sirius, and Rigel. And those are you know, a way that you can find those six different constellations by following the bright stars that are easily visible within that Winter Circle. So this is something that you might play around with if we get a clear night one of these days, uh, is finding that Winter Circle. Uh, generally, if we were in person, we would be going to the planetarium and we would use that planetarium experience as a way to find this. Uh, but we won't be doing that this term for obvious reasons. And so instead, you can use the, um, the software that we'll use in this class, Starry Night, uh, to find these patterns and then go outside and look at them yourself if you are so inclined. All right, so we have constellations, which are kind of a sector of sky. We have asterisms, which are the actual patterns within or across those constellations. And we can also watch not only the patterns of the stars, but the motion of the stars in the sky. So this is also a part of astronomy, is watching how things develop and change over time. So this uh, image is a long exposure photograph taken in Hawaii, and the stars, if you take a long exposure photograph, appear to smear out into long arcs that we call star trails. And as you can see here, they're, they're circling um, one particular point in the sky. And to understand exactly why this star trail photo looks the way it does, uh, we have to ask, well, how do the stars move in the sky, and why do they appear to do so? So let me ask you that, just based on whatever prior knowledge you may be bringing into the class, uh, why do you think stars appear to move across the sky? Okay, most of you have voted, um, and I see the most votes for E, that the stars appear to move across the sky because Earth spins on its axis. And that's correct. So the stars do actually have some amount of motion on their own. They do literally move through space. But the vast majority of the motion that we see on the night sky is due to Earth's rotation. Um, so this is for a single night. Over the course of a single night, the stars appear to rise and set in the sky uh, and otherwise circle the North Star because of our spin on our axis. But it's also true that over the course of the year, we see different constellations because the Earth is in different positions around the sun. So A, the Earth orbits the sun, is also more or less true. All right, so the tool that we use to understand the position of stars in the sky is called the celestial sphere. And the ancient Greeks thought that the celestial sphere was a literal sphere of um, crystal that was dotted with stars that rotated around the Earth. And for that reason, all the stars appeared to move uniformly together. And this is a perfectly reasonable thing to think. Uh, if you, know, you don't have any reason to think otherwise, that's what they look like they're doing. And we still use this model to this day because it's an effective way to pick out the positions of stars in the sky. If you're an observer sitting on the Earth, you get up only to see half of that sphere at one time because your horizon hides the other half. And which half of the sphere you see depends on where you are on the Earth. So when we are an observer standing on the surface of the Earth, if I walked outside and wanted to describe to you the position of a star, um, I would tell you how far off the horizon it is. That would be a handy dandy way. If I have a protractor and can measure that my star is 45 degrees off the horizon, then I can tell you to get out your protractor uh, and go and measure that angle and look for the star. And then I would also have to tell you, in addition to how far off the horizon it is, uh, whether it's in the north or the east, the south or the west. And so those two angles are called the altitude. That's the distance off the horizon. And then the azimuth is measured from north, and it goes positive as you go eastward until you wind up with you know 360 degrees back at north. So those two coordinates are useful if you're just walking outside and describing how to find a star to someone who is also at your location. But this doesn't work for your observer if your observer is seeing a completely different part of the sky than you, right? So for that reason, we have to go back to our celestial sphere and say we need to have some kind of universal way to mark out the locations of stars in the sky. So our celestial sphere has some special coordinates. Um, as any sphere, it has a pole, uh, a north celestial pole and a south celestial pole, which you can think of as extending from Earth's north and south poles. It has an equator, which you can think of as Earth's equator projected into space. And each observer has their own zenith point, which is the point directly overhead. And so this zenith point is going to point to a different location on the celestial sphere, depending on where you're standing on Earth. And we can use this sphere, spherical coordinates, to pick out the position of a star. And so when we're talking about the celestial sphere coordinates, the ones that are universal regardless of observer's position, uh, these are the declination and the right ascension. So the declination is kind of like the latitude on the celestial sphere. It's measured from the equator up to the north celestial pole as a positive angle, and then from the equator down to the south celestial pole as a negative angle. So any star that has a positive declination is visible in the northern hemisphere, and any star that has a negative declination is only visible if you're in the southern hemisphere. And then the right ascension is kind of like the longitude position, um, except it doesn't start from the same place that Earth's longitude zero starts from. It starts from where the sun happens to be on the celestial sphere at the spring equinox. So don't worry about that, but just know that the right ascension is often um, stated as a time, 
uh, because it's the kind of the distance around as the celestial sphere appears to rotate around the Earth. So sometimes it's measured as a time, sometimes it's measured as an angle. Um, and don't worry about where the zero position is. The thing about these celestial coordinates is that this is what you'll find in most um, astronomy atlases. So a star atlas would tell you the declination and right ascension, and you can convert those. And most of most you know planetarium software that you find on the internet automatically converts those to an azimuth and an altitude for your convenience of finding a star at your location. I'll show you an example of this in a minute. Okay, but first I want to ask you a question about declination. So declination um, for Polaris. Polaris is near the North Celestial Pole. So is the declination of Polaris a plus 90 degrees, b zero degrees, c minus 90 degrees, or d? It depends on your latitude. Okay, it looks like most of you have voted, uh, and I'm seeing the most votes for A, that the declination of Polaris is almost positive 90 degrees. And that's right, so the declination is positive for stars in the northern hemisphere, and the north celestial pole is at exactly plus 90 degrees. So you can only measure from zero to plus 90 if you're measuring from the equator to a pole. So the um, limits on declination is it has to either be between plus 90 and zero for the north, or zero and minus 90 for the south. Um, while we're thinking about declination, uh, let's compare it to altitude. So in San Francisco, there are 500 miles south of Eugene, more or less. Um, let's consider the star Polaris in San Francisco. Is its altitude or declination different than it is in Eugene, or is it the same? All right, so um, I want to mention that the stars appear to move around the North Star uh, because this whole celestial sphere is rotating around its own axes. You know, it's an imaginary object. That's what it's appearing to do because of Earth's rotation around its axis. And so all the stars appear to circle either the North Celestial Pole, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, or the South Celestial Pole, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. So when we look at the pictures of star trails, um, then the circles that they make are around that North or South Celestial Pole. And uh, the sun, the moon, and the planets also appear as if they're going around the Earth, right? Even though we know that the sun is at the center of the solar system, the Earth orbits the sun, that's not how it looks from our position. But they don't follow, they don't just circle the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole, they travel along a path called the ecliptic. And that is uh, tilted at uh, 23.5 degrees from the celestial equator. The reason it's tilted is because Earth's axis is also tilted, and so the sun appears at different uh, altitudes depending both on uh, time of year, but also, I guess, on time of day. Okay, so the ecliptic is special because if you think about where it is on the celestial sphere, what it means is that the sun is moving along the ecliptic and so are the planets. And the, they travel through different constellations as they go through the course of a year along that path. And so those constellations, because they were traversed by the sun and the planets, were thought to be special. And so in general, uh, you know, cultures assign special uh, importance to those constellations. And these are the constellations of the zodiac. So there are in fact 13 modern constellations in the zodiac. Uh, the 12 that you're used to from the you know, folklore of astrology, plus one, Ophiuchus, that uh, became part of the zodiac in 1928 when the official constellations were defined. So um, from my perspective, as someone who's not really interested in astrology, this is what's special about the zodiac, that the sun and the planets appear to move through those regions of space. But astrologers also assign cultural significance to those um, zodiac signs. 